everybody. Zach Dittmars here for Fish Talk Magazine. Thanks for joining us again for another edition of Live with Lenny. Uh, before we get started tonight, I'm going to run down a few uh, upcoming events, and then we'll bring on the Anger in Chief. So um, first off, I start uh, just with the Great Chesapeake Invasive Camp. This runs all year long. It's a, sponsored by the Coastal Conservation Association of Maryland. It You catch a northern snakehead, flathead catfish, or blue catfish anywhere in the Chesapeake Maryland, Virginia waterways. Um, you can submit those catches to the Great Invasive Count and you can win some great prizes. So um, to find all these upcoming events, head over to fishtalkmag.com forward slash calendar and you can find a whole list of upcoming events. I'd also like to mention next weekend is the Chesapeake Fishing Open, 15th and 16th of September. On Saturday will be the Oysters Blues and Brews Brews Fest, which is the uh, culmination of the tournament, tournament party, but there's also going to be uh, trash shoreline cleanup, kids fishing derby, some educational uh, seminars, um, as well as the tournament party featuring Kelly Bell Band. So it's going to be really cool if you're not doing the tournament, head on up to Port Covington. It is free. Head on over to uh, oysterbluesandbrews.com and you can get free tickets, uh, but you have to pre-register and they're going fast. So uh, check that out. The following weekend was going to be the Tangier Classic. That's down in Jane's Island, uh, American Legion at Chris Field, and that's uh, September 22nd to the 24th. And then also the Annapolis Boat Shows is coming up right around the corner. So make sure you grab your tickets over at AnnapolisBoatShows.com. We're going to have the Fish Talk Fishing Spot. Uh, all kinds of great stuff going on again this year. Um, last but not least, I just wanted to mention the Chesapeake Perspective. That's on September 21st. We're going to have some great special guests. We're going to be talking about habitat uh, and the future of that for the Chesapeake Bay. All right. Sorry, that's a mouthful. But uh, again, head on over to FishTalkMag.com calendar for all these cool events. And without further ado, Mr. Lenny Rudo, the Angler in Chief, how you doing? Hey, Zach. Holy cow. It's a busy fall, isn't it? Yeah, it's awesome. Tons of cool fishy stuff going on. There is a horde of stuff going on. Kind of amazing how much, although every fall it seems that way. Like, you you, you know, you get to fall and you're so excited for the fall bite, which we're going to talk about. And then all this stuff starts going on. It's like, holy cow, you got the tournaments, you got the boat shows. It is just a lot of stuff. Absolutely. It's awesome. And it we got some guys tuning in. Hey, Walt. We got so, Kevin. What's happening, man? So, so uh, we're going to start off tonight talking about the current bite because there is actually a lot going on on the fishing front, too. And then we're going to segue into what's in store for 2024. And, man, this is kind of a big deal. There is a lot going on specifically with the rockfish fishery. So, we're going to dive into all that, but uh, we also want to make mention, folks, we have a prize winner tonight. Wayne Young has graciously decided to uh, uh, dedicate one of his books for a prize. Uh, I lost the email, and at this point, Wayne has written so many books, I don't even remember which one he specified, or if he specified, or just said, hey, I'll pitch in a book for a prize, but... Uh, you know, folks are very familiar with Wayne's work, I'm sure, if they're familiar with Fish Talk, because he has done a ton of where-to articles, and, and his examination of structure and reefs is really in-depth. There's some really good fishing intel in each and every one of those articles, in each and every one of those books. So stay tuned till the end, folks. You might be a winner. Meanwhile, Zach, let's throw up slide number one. Let's get right to the uh, current bite. What do you think? You got it. So, and it's kind of funny. We're sitting here talking about the current bite because Zach was on my boat last night. We ran out for a, ooh, just a last light trip. We just caught the, the very end of the evening bite, but there were fish like this to be caught. Um, I didn't have a specific reason for choosing this for slide number one, other than the fact that I'm sitting right next to the Suzuki. And Suzuki is a great supporter of Fish Talk. We appreciate that. And uh, I've got a 300 on my boat. The thing runs like a top. I've been loving it. Uh, as my crabbing skiff has a 25 on it, that thing runs like a top. Uh, they just seem to do that. So uh, last night we got into some breaking fish. It was nice to see there are some fish churning water on the north side of Poplar Island. Uh, more more bluefish than rock. I'm not. I don't remember what the ratio was. I don't know if you do, Zach, but definitely more blues than rock, right? As I recall, there were. And um, um, They seem to be schools of both, but yeah, I think there were more blues than rock. 
Yeah, and they were running. They were decent bluefish. They were running like one to two pounds. Uh, we didn't get any of the real big ones that have been showing up. There have been some much bigger bluefish showing up, particularly in the Tangier Sound, but also a few in the Chop Tank. I'm talking, you know, five, six, seven pounders. Um, they've been getting dumped some down towards the Patuxent, too. Uh, so there are some really nice blues around. These fish were doing what they often do at this time of year. They were coming up, popping the water for, uh, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and then going back down. So uh, the birds didn't always even have time to get over them before we got there. Uh, and then, and then, you know, but once you get to that spot, even if they stop, go ahead and throw out, let your lure sink a little bit. It's not necessarily the surface frenzy kind of action at that point. And uh, you'll catch some fish for, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes before, you know, they're gone. And just keep your eyes out for birds to be flying in one direction or, or you know, a bunch of ripples to suddenly appear on the water. Hey, maybe that's breaking fish. Uh, usually they were popping up somewhere between like 100 yards and 300 yards from where they were the last time. Um, but they are given some, I, I would call it sporadic surfing action, surface action. Uh, right on the north side of Poplar, right right in the evening hours. We got over there at like 6, and they were already doing it, and they kept it up until, you know, it was time to run for home, until it was getting dark. So pretty cool stuff. All right, Zach, let's go ahead to the next slide if we could. Oh, what bait is being used? So, Maureen, we were using uh, a range of paddle tails and spoons, and you really had to have uh, the bite-proof plastics because if you're throwing the paddle tails and they're not bite proofs, uh, AKA Z-mans, uh, they're just gonna get snapped right off. And, and we did have multiple bite offs. We did bring back some non-bite proof plastics with the tails missing. So uh, they were on between half ounce and one ounce jig heads. They were all working just fine. And then uh, when the blues were, were splashing hard we we did throw some spoons for a while we we're throwing uh one ounce i believe they were the shimano spoons i'm blanking on the name zach do you remember the name of the shimano spoons i know that's a uh, we sure when the, i was throwing the afco crossbreed oh the afco crossbreed okay okay i i know vadim tied on one at one point that was one of the one of the little shimanos and i'm blanking on the name of those spoons but mm -hmm. that, um, but little, you know, little, say three to four inch, one ounce spoons were working good. All right, let's pop up that next slide. This one's exciting, people. Finally, finally, we've been waiting all summer. We've been waiting since June 15th. <laughs> and we have not had a great cobia bite really anywhere, you know, once you got much north of the CBBT. But for whatever reason, in the last couple of weeks, these fish have started coming on and it's getting better and better. So trolling uh, tubes has been the way to go. Red tubes behind planers is how you want to target these fish. You want to set that tube maybe 15, 20 feet behind a planer. Try a number one, a number two. A number three will sometimes work, but might start digging bottom in the areas where these fish are popping up, which are only 15, 18 feet deep. Um, the uh, live bottom south of the target ship has definitely been the hot zone. That's where they're showing up in good numbers. And uh, we got this photo from the prime time uh, last week. Uh, well, last week or this week? Last week or this week. It was recent. And uh, on the prime time, they were pulling those tubes and they were catching fish up to 50 inches. We're talking multiples throughout the course of the day, too. And it really hasn't been that way this summer. This summer has been a really a lackluster cobia bite. Uh, once you got to, you know, the, the relatively northern areas of the Chesapeake Bay, the, the I would call it the middle lower bay up to the middle bay uh, point lookout the Patuxent, that zone where the last few years we've had really good cobia bites, but this year it just hadn't been happening. Now it is. Now it is. So they go out on September 15th. You got about, uh, what is that, a week to catch them? I think that's about a week. Yeah, that's uh, the 15th is next Friday. So a week and a day. If you want to get these fish, folks, now's the time. Go out and go after them. Interestingly, we have not been getting 
a lot of reports of success from the Chummers and the Ealers. Um, you know, that's often in this zone of the Bay, that's a better way to get them. Uh, but that, those reports have not been flowing in. It's It's been trolling tubes. So if you want to get these fish, now's a chance. Get your poke. All right, Zach, let's go ahead to the next slide if we could, please. Oh, wait a minute. We have a question first. What color pattern and weight for the Z-Mans at the Tolchester? Tolchester. There we go, the Tolchester area in October. So in October, uh, I would be throwing the four and five inchers. And the weight is going to depend on what depth the fish are in. If you're in, oh, let's see, 10 feet or less of water fishing the early and late uh, shallows bite, you're, you're going to want a half an ounce. But if they're in 15, 20 feet of water, and it's a little, you know, maybe it's a little later in the day, maybe they're schooling there, you're going to want to go to like an ounce. Uh, you might, you know, might want to go to an ounce and a half when they shift even deeper than that. Now, I can't say just when that's going to happen. It may happen in October. It may happen in November. When the water gets really cold, that's when they'll start shuffling deeper and deeper and deeper. But, you know, one ounce head is kind of always a great intermediary pick, three quarters of an ounce sometimes if the fish are shallow. Um, so that that would be that'd be the way that I'm going to go. Uh, now with the Z-Mans at that time, you got to remember the Z-Mans are actually slightly buoyant. They're not like other plastics, which are pretty much neutrally buoyant. They, they have a little bit of buoyancy to them. So, uh, you know, you, you may find upping the weight just a little bit as compared to what you use for other stuff is a good move. Now, I'll also say in October uh, at Tolchester, you're talking rockfish and pretty much nothing but, right? So, you know, you might, you, there are plenty of other plastics that will work really, really well. You can throw a BKD. Uh, you can throw the little white paddle tails. I like the uh, the killer baits. Um, there's a lot of different options. It's when the blues are around that you really like. You better be using the Z-Mans or else. <laughs> the the uh, the blues and the Spanish mackerel, although that really hasn't been such a big player this year. Once you got north of the Tangier, there just haven't been a whole heck of a lot of them. Unlike the last few years, when those toothy fish are around, it's got to be Z-Mans. All right, Zach, you want to take us on to the next slide, unless we got another question. And folks, remember, we want your questions. Feel free to pop them into the comments. That is why we do this live. And we got another one. The Z-Man Slam Shadies have been on fire for me this summer. Thomas, you are not alone. That is a good bait right there. That is a good bait. And blue fever color and weight. I'm not sure. What's the blue fever? Help that me. Is, I think uh, Gary's referring to the AFCO uh, lures we were using, which are actually the, a brand new one called the Crossbreed. And they are the smallest variety they offer, but they're in grams. And I don't remember what they were because it's crazy that they sell those in grams. So uh, <laughs> the grams like, always confuse me too. 60 gram or something like that. It's it's the smallest one they had. And it's It looks just like a bunker. I'm going to um, see. I'm going to say that looked like it was like an ounce or an ounce and a half, right? Yeah, but they, for whatever reason, the, the variety is coming. Yeah. Who can Google 50 grams, gram to ounce calculator real quick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that always confused me. And the Shimano settlement, they they uh, rate them by grams too. It endlessly confuses me. Why can't everyone else just do American? Huh? Why do we have to do grams? Can't we do ounces, pounds, uh, miles? I've been working on my boat, jockeying between metric and standard. It's like, you know, I feel like I'm switching back and forth every five minutes. It drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. And All I understand right. this whole, you know, standardized thing, the rest of the world, blah, blah, blah. Come on. Ounces, pounds, miles, please. 20, 28 grams in an ounce. So uh, 28 grams in an ounce. So that might have been a two ounce you were throwing. Yeah, maybe like a four. I think it was a 40, so like one and a half. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's the response one. All right. Um, I'm not sure what Vince is talking about. Uh, the new vibe lures. Are you familiar with those, Lenny? I'm um, Vince. You're going to have to give me a little more detail. I'm not sure what you're going by there. Vibe lures. Hmm. Not sure. Yeah, not sure either. Hmm. Um, maybe it's a it's a new nomad lure, I believe. Uh, anywho, uh, is that the nomad subsurface swimmer? I'm not entirely sure. It kind of looks like that. Yeah. The, the, the okay. Nomad Subsurface Swimmer, I went and bought a bunch after uh, we had Yellowfin busting water and they 
demolished multiple lures. Kevin said they stink, so I don't oh, know. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> I know he knows how to fish. All right, some more questions here. Uh, is there a good all-around lure for puppy drum stripers and specs around the docks? Yeah, you know what? I got a great one. Well, I got a couple great ones for you. First off, a three-inch white paddle tail is gold. A four-inch white paddle tail, if you want to look for larger fish, you, you'll eliminate some of the smaller specks using that um, and some of the smaller pups. Uh, but a three-inch white paddle tail is gold. Now, something that I love throwing to docks, a perch pounder. You know what? Puppy drum love perch pounders. Rockfish love perch pounders. Specs will hit them too. You don't seem to love them with quite as much abandon. Uh, but a chartreuse or a white perch pounder is a killer for the puppy drum. And the rockfish go after them like nuts. And yeah, oops, you'll catch some perch too. Um, but I bring this one up because there's something specific about the perch pounders. And that is that a lot of the smaller spinner baits, um, your beetle spins, your um, oh man, I can't remember the the yellow with the orange polka dots. I love that one. Super rooster, really good baits. Catch a lot of fish. A puppy drum, if you get one that's slot size, will bend those suckers straight. But the perch pounder has a pretty thick wire and a pretty thick hook, and it will stand up to a decent sized fish. So uh, if you want to go throwing for those fish around docks, I, I would try a perch pounder and keep that white paddle tail handy. When they're a little bit bigger, you're going to want a, even a thicker hook than that. Uh, and that, that white paddle tail does a trick. All right. Got a lot more questions. Uh, Holy mackerel. All right. We'll wait, for, we'll wait for the next slide. Just pop them up there, Zach. All right. I'm trying to star them. There's so many. <laughs> got a great audience tonight thanks for tuning in excellent all right uh so vince was saying that the nomad back to the nomad uh they vibrate in the fall when retrieved just coming out but it's a new lore we'll have to check them out try them for ourselves uh, all right we got it. okay kevin hey kevin any theories on why the patapsco has been a hot spot for live lining versus tolchester in years past well you know what i mean i could give theories but the truth of the matter is i don't know why did all those fish go to Baltimore and sit there all year? I don't know. And, you know, the, the, the biologists often tell us that these fish get trapped, right? They go to one of these areas up north, and then you have problems with the dead zones and low oxygen levels, and they kind of get stuck there. But, you know, this year we had a very minor league dead zone as compared to usual. Uh, because of the, the, the way the weather was in the spring. And so I'm not sure that's necessarily what's going on. Um, but the truth of the matter, Kevin, is I just don't know. Those fish went up there, and they stayed there all year, and they said, this is great. We're going to hang out near Baltimore. Who knows why? Um, our buddies at Hogfin, possibly dolphins pushing them in. Dolphins may have pushed them in, but, you know, the dolphins have been all over the place. Um, From personal experience, I can tell you that the Patapsco is loaded with gizzard shad. Loaded. Up by this, the, 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 apple, the blader pipe, what do you call that, the discharge, the end of the Patapsco? Maybe they got up there and said, hey, there's plenty to eat, you know? Yeah. It's strange. It's, you know, all, all these things that go on in the bay – we're, we're trying to explain why a wild creature did what it did. And we have a hard enough time explaining why we do what we do, right? Yeah. I mean, people do a lot of nutty things. Greener water in the harbor? I don't know about that, but you know, maybe. maybe. <laughs> well, you know, I, I remember in the 90s, we used to catch plenty of rockfish, believe me, in the Patapsco. Now, it wasn't the big giant school that went up there and sat. It was fish on structure. But, you know, there have always been rockfish in the Patapsco and in you know, year to year, relatively decent numbers. Um, I, shoot, I can remember throwing a broken down pier pilings and catching fish up to 26 inches all day long, you know? It, it's not a bad zone. Mm -hmm. I saw um, I saw a question come up and then disappear, and I don't know if I wasn't quick enough. Oh, it was a, it was a comment from Kevin. Just he see more rays okay. and system taps were there before, just adding to the diversity of wildlife that we're seeing up north. Sea yeah. bass in the Patapsco. Yes, right. Sea bass showed up up there this year. 
And in your couple decades, you, you've been on fishing the Chesapeake for a few decades, right? Just a couple. <laughs> you've never heard of that before. That's a, a, a unprecedented event. So pretty wild. The yeah, I, I, when I was a kid, I mean, I can I can claim to remember as far back as into the seventies. You get into the sixties, I I really can't remember. Um, but even back then, you know, it was unusual to see that stuff in the Patapsco, but it would happen. It would happen. Porpoises would wander around. Um, I, you know, was it, was it the early 2000s, a manatee swam into Baltimore Harbor? You know, go figure. <laughs> They're wild creatures. They do wild things. <laughs> yeah, there was actually one in the Southern Bay just a week or two ago. Yeah, right. I remember seeing the pictures of it. Yeah. Um, the one the one that went into Baltimore like 20 years ago they actually flew it back to Florida and the next year the thing came right back and they were like okay we spent a lot of money flying you to Florida we're not doing that again <laughs> um Kevin said his son recently caught a snapping turtle on a perch pounder wow <laughs> and um, similar to the perch pounder the beetle spin it's kind of like the super rooster Eric, I can't believe Eric's tuning in. Hey. And he loves the Beatles spin. I, I got no argument against the Beatles spin. Um, and, and you can build your own. It's I just like I like the perch pounders construction. Just got a little more beef, but the Beatles spin is a killer. Uh, um, also the super rooster that I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of fish that love that soup. Snakeheads love the super rooster and the perch pounder. And so the Beatles spin. They're actually called the perch. Hounder now with an H. Hounder. What? There was some kind of name trademark or something. Really? Yeah, that the perch hounders now. Captain Burt's perch hounders. Oi. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let me uh I got a few more questions. Um since uh since we were on uh the Cobia topic, uh your buddy John is in here. Hey, hey John Middle Bay with the warm water temps. So a few. A few have popped up here and there in the Middle Bay zone. When we talk Middle Bay, of course, we're generally talking the Bay Bridge to Point Lookout. Uh, a few have shown up recently. It's been recent. I'm not aware of any area where the numbers have been high enough that you really would want to go and target them, spend all day on them. Um, that, that really, the northernmost point I'm aware of right now where that's really going on would be, again, south of the target ships on the live bottom. They, they have been there in numbers. Um, there have been some popping up as far north, to my knowledge, as Eastern Bay. You know, it happens. It happens pretty much every year. But the numbers just aren't really there to support like a, a directed fishery most of the time. I think it was two years ago. There, were, there was about a two-week span where they actually were behind Poplar Island uh, on the on the east side of Poplar Island, and guys were going and targeting them and catching them, and that continued for about two weeks. But I, I you know, that was about two years ago. I'm not sure that's happening right now. <laughs> Kevin, I'll bet Eric is happy to see that. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> All right. Um, so since we're we're still in the the we're kind of bouncing right back to where we were a few minutes ago on the Patapsco. Uh, Andrew asks, any tips for fishing the Fort Carroll area? He's caught rock on riprap nearby, but not a bite at the fort. Well, that's an interesting question, Andrew, and I wish I had a good answer for you. The truth is, I, years ago, that was a spot that I regularly fished. I haven't been up there in many years, and I feel like things change so much through time. I might say something wrong if I say something about Fort Carroll in specific. Um I will say this, the slag peeps, I guess that's south and east at the old, uh, the old steel mill, um, that used to often like be better. And the base of the, the, um, the bridge itself used to be better. The pilings used to be better. Fort Carroll used to be really good for white perch, but you wouldn't, I don't remember catching a ton of rockfish around it. It was more like a white perch spot for me. And that was years ago. So I can't, you know, um, I, I shouldn't even talk to it. It's been a long time since I fished up there. Jay's asking where the perch are this year. Jay, the perch fishing the last, I think, three years in a row has not been what it should be. 
the white perch numbers are definitely down. They, they, those fish used to be so dang plentiful, you couldn't hardly shake a stick at the water and not catch one. And it hasn't been that way the last few years. I think this year is better than last year. Um, I can't tell you I know what's going on. I'm scared that this could be a blue cat thing. And the reason I say that is several of my personal spring white perch spots have not been good in recent years and I'm throwing out a shad dart with a grass shrimp on it and I'm catching blue cats like 20 plus pounders. And this is during the white perch, what should be the white perch run. So I'm scared of that, but I don't have any, you know, direct evidence that that's an impact that's going on. Sure seems that way. All right. Circling back to, um, <clears throat> Forgive me, I forget forget the name of the question, but the, the question for Fort Carroll, David Rudeau. So ah. northwest side of Fort Carroll, the outgoing tide crew. Nice. A lot for him. Nice. Thanks for chiming in, Dave. But are you talking rockfish? I think David's talking rockfish, but let's just specify to make sure. I'm pretty sure that's what he's talking about because he doesn't spend much time perch fishing. He's usually throwing for the rockfish. Gotcha. And then uh, Kevin says, find the oyster reef on the east side, east side of the fort as they're making a new oyster bed there. Nice. Thank you, guys. Just for the record, I, I I appreciate Kevin's picture. I would like that basket, please. <laughs> He's got a full basket there. That's my basket. Oh, I haven't seen a basket that nice in a while. That's that's the, our trip. That's from our trip. You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just come over to my house, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting more and more jealous each time. Uh, so uh, Dave says, yeah, that, that was a rockfish. Rockfish. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So two tons of questions still catching up here. Uh, all right. Um, all right. So back to uh, our back to slide number one. Um, Dave Bug was fishing the mouse at Eastern Bay yesterday. We might have seen him one of those boats out there. We were right next to you, Dave. Blues love the spoons. Striper snatched up Sartre's paddle tails. What do you re recommend for the max? Oh, I have a new favorite for the Max. Ever since um, the uh, Mike and Julia, yep, they I, I took them out of my boat, and they were like popping corks for Spanish mackerel, popping corks for Spanish mackerel, and I'm like, what? Gold spoon for Spanish mackerel? Like it's been that way since the history of man, right? And they they made me a true believer. Popping cork, three foot leader, half to three quarter ounce jig head three inch tooth proof plastic you put that rig together and the mackerel flock they love it they flock to it i don't know why uh but they absolutely love it now you don't fish it like you would fish a popping cork in florida completely different ball game you're casting it out and as soon as it hits the water you're chugging it back almost like you were fishing a popper chug 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 never stopping right we all know mackerel like speed they don't want that thing to stop constant retrieve constant chugging and uh, i've had multiple days in the last few years where the mackerel have been jumping around and everybody's throwing everything and the popping cork is the magic it 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 does it and i think that there's the cajun thunder corks That's and exactly. their hard head custom bait jig heads where they, you know. it's exactly what it is pink tails white tails chartreuse tails seen them all work um but that's that has become my Spanish mackerel light tackle go-to. And that was 100% not true three years ago. Three years ago, I would have said gold spoon. You know, yeah. but that's that popping cork has taken over for me. I've just seen it catch too many mackerel when other stuff was catching everything else, blues, rock, whatever. That popping cork does it. And the blues and the rock will hit it too, but, but the mackerel really seem to like it. Yeah. I think we have an article at fishtalkmag.com specifically about how to target Spanish mackerel with the popping corks. Pretty darn sure. If you plug Spanish mackerel into the search box, I'll bet that article will come up. I'm, I'm sure I wrote about that. Cool. He's uh, going to go for the slam next week. Nice. <laughs> and um, in case you thought I was lying about those crabs, uh, you know, he said he caught him with Zach. Caught him with Zach. Okay. Credit where credit's due. All right. And hey, Dr. Fish, how you doing? <laughs> I, I, 
I never claim to be the best crabber in the world, okay? I struggle, but I, I get by. But, Zach, you seem to have, like, man, you've taken that bull by the horns. Mm. I just, uh, I just, just the, uh, it's a water access. Lucked into it, you know? <laughs> Un, well, uh, unfettered waters. It, you know, for me, it's doubly aggravating that you kick my butt like that when you're running a 600 foot, right? Right. Yeah, I'm running 1,200. And you're I've still got, crushing me. <laughs> I've got the the rigging time down to like 30 minutes. Oh. I do it the night before. It makes it so much more enjoyable the day of the day of the video crab. You know. Are you using chicken necks? Yep. Okay. With the Procure. The Procure. Maybe that. Maybe I got to try that. Try the Procure. It's messy, but I, I think it works. Could you explain, please? It's just like a big gallon jug of Procure Crab Attractant. It looks like Pepto Bismol, and you just pour it on your line after you've rigged it. Hmm. The whole thing? No, just just a, like a cup. I should okay. that, that gallon has lasted me two two seasons. I'm. I think I'd better get some of that stuff. I ordered it uh, online because no one had it in stores. A couple of the stores had this blue stuff I've seen, but I haven't seen it lately. So anyway. Procure Crab Attractant. I'm making a note. Mm. All right. Well, you know, I, I think I made Kevin a believer. He switched to kayak crabbing, and he caught more by switching to a kayak. Wow. Okay. Craziness. All right. Um, all right. You keep mentioning paddle tail. Mm -hmm. You prefer them over the twisty curly tails or consider them the same? And if the paddle, can you explain why you like those better? So... Here's what I found through the years. I originally, if you talked to me when I was in my 20s, I was a twister guy. I was. Through the years, I have shifted to being a paddle tail guy. I do feel like I catch more fish. And I can give you the I think why. I can't give you the I'm sure why. But I think so. One of the things I've noticed with twister tails is often on the sink, they they spin if they're not rigged absolutely perfectly. They kind of they, they do like a corkscrew as they go down. The paddle tail doesn't do that. It sinks straight down. I think that's one factor. Second factor, when you snap jig a paddle tail, right? You give it a really hard jig. It gets a really great action as it shoots up. It actually swims with a twister tail. The tail spins faster, but that's about it. I don't think the lure actually swims any differently. Now, this is conjecture. I don't know this for a fact, but I think that those things help you catch more fish. It, it, you know, they activate the fish a little better on the strike. Um, I, I have no scientific evidence of this. I've never done any kind of test, but through the years, I did transition from twisters to paddles. One exception, when you're trolling and something like bottom bouncing a jig in a tributary along the channel edge for rockfish. For whatever reason, the twister is an utter killer. And I love the twister tail for that. Maybe that's because when you're jigging the rod as you troll, you're, you're giving it a lot more action. I don't know, but it does work really well for that. Vince is saying paddle tails vibrate better. They seem to. Does that make a dip? Is that what's making it? I don't know. You know, I mean, they're man, that's a tough thing to really figure out. But what I know for sure is through the years, over time, I made that transition because I felt like I was catching more fish with the paddle tail. And but to me, that's that's pretty telling. You know, uh, I'm not sure anybody has any really solid science on paddle versus twister. But over, you know, 30 years, when you find you're catching more fish, it's kind of tough to argue with. Ah, here comes Wayne. My new book covering the upper middle bays will be on Amazon in about a week. Uh, excerpts have already been a fish talk and more coming. Thank you, Wayne. Which did we, did you specify a book for a prize tonight, or is it uh, winner's choice? I'm not. I, I I'm not sure we had a specification, but let us know, and we'll let everybody else know. And towards the end of the show, we're going to pick a winner. So uh, how are we doing on quite? We haven't even made it to slide three yet. Uh, I've got like 10 bookmarked questions. Oh, my God. All right. 
Zach, right. we're, we're going to do a lightning. Them. Let's gonna, do a lightning round. All right. all right, this one, I'm going to group them together, and then mm -hmm. we have one that will transition us to the next slide. So I'm going to group them together. Uh, okay. First off, Gary's asking about uh, favorite rod brand and specs that you use most. And I will say the last night, we are using the same exact gear. So we you, were. Well, you love, I love. And I before I even met you, we were using the same kind of rod. <laughs> you did turn me on to a specific type of reel that I now use religiously. And I'll yep. let you answer the question. So real wise, we're talking Shimano Stratic. Rod wise, we're talking St. Croix. Um, very simple. The Shimano is the Stratic is a tank for the money. That reel will last you longer than anything else. The drag is smooth. It operates wonderfully. It's really hard to knock a Stratic. You can spend more on another reel, but you know there's like a point of diminishing returns. You spend X amount, and it's like an A plus. And then you spend a ton to get to an A plus plus, and that A plus is, in my opinion, is a Stratic. And evidently Zach agrees because he's he's a Stratic guy too. And, and but, the only Achilles heel is that roller bearing, which yep. they have up improved. And anglers just got in stock. The new brand new Stratics are now available. Nice, nice. And that roller bearing, even even on the even on the older ones, that roller bearing would last you you know years, and then you'd have to replace it. It would get all make a scratchy noise. Um, but, but anyway, you cut, I mean, it's a mind boggling reel in my, if you, all those rods you see behind you there, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight Stratix back there hanging off of those rods. And most of those rods are St. Croix. I got a few Shimano rods. I like the rods too, but I got a lot of St. Croix. I really just love the super fast action, the lightness and the way that, you know, for jigging, the way that they feel is just awesome to me. Here comes Wayne, new Bay, Bay, Bay Bridge book. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Wayne. All right, lightning round me, Zach. Come on, we got to get through these, man. We're not. You you would have all Loomis's if you could, though. We are behind schedule. Oh well, don't get me started. <laughs> all right, so we got a, a slew of questions uh, pertaining to stripers, and uh, that was the top of the conversation. So uh, since that was sort of how we started out. Mike asked if he has any tips for targeting rockfish in the early morning between Thomas Point and the West River. And that is your backyard. That is my home territory. Interesting question. Uh, yeah, I would say first off, I wouldn't necessarily between Thomas be between Thomas Point and the West River. I would be at Thomas Point or in the West River. Uh, in the river, casting to docks is is definitely going to be a good bet. At the point, uh, you know, everybody and their brother goes to the lighthouse. My first piece of advice is don't go right to the lighthouse. You know, everybody and their brother goes there. Sometimes it's holding fish, yeah, but it's often beat to death. Uh, the shoal just outside of the point has uh, rock piles where the lighthouses used to be, you're, you know, a bazillion years ago, and the, the rock, the stone lighthouses fell down, and now there are rocks down there. Um, those shoals hold a lot of fish. They're holding fish right now. They're, they're, I have a slide coming up. We were going to talk about that. They're holding fish right now. Uh, uh, so that's a really good zone. Sorry, just to backpedal. I know we're all over the place. Uh, rod spec. So what's your uh, action and length? And I like a fast action six-foot light rod or a light medium. Um, I like – most guys like a six, six, or a seven. I like a six. And the main reason is I think it's a hangover from the kids. When the kids were little, I made sure they all had shorter rods – to limit the arc of destruction and I just got used to them. And that's what I use now. Most guys are going to say a six, six or a seven, but fast action. Yeah, for sure. For the jig. All right. Uh, back to the striper questions. Uh, new to stripers, not strippers. Where's good spots to start looking North of the Bay bridge. So the Patapsco is a great starting zone, right? That there are a ton of fish up there right now. You go up to the Patapsco, you cast docks, you cast all the broken down wharves, uh, you cast the ferry bar, you cast the uh, key bridge. All, all of those are really good spots to start looking. Uh, one of the other, uh, uh, I can't not mention Bodkin. The, the rocks outside of Bodkin Creek are good. Um, on the other side, uh, Pools Island has been holding a lot of fish. We've been getting a lot of reports from guys there who are catching. They're mostly eeling. They're mostly eeling, but they're catching good, dropping the eels. Both north side and south side, there are a lot of lumps, crazy lumps, where they did dredging for shell years and years ago. 
and those crazy lumps hold those fish. So those are all really good spots. Uh, Hart Miller, you can cast around the backside of Hart Miller where the rocks are. That's all good stuff too. Um, all, all good places to try for the rock. What do you expect for Wayne North on the flats for rockfish? Man, I don't know what to expect. Uh, there was some good fishing there earlier. We have not gotten a lot of reports lately. And honestly, I don't know if that's because the fishing dropped off or people are trying to keep it quiet. They just haven't told me. Normally, we do get a decent number of reports from up there when it's happening. Um, so I'm, I'm unsure about the flats right now. It's a question mark. All right, here we go. Jesse's asking about the birds in the Middle Bay. Yeah, man. Um, well, we saw them last night north of Poplar. That, And it wasn't what I would call a bird show. It was like the fish came up long enough to attract birds and then went down. And, you know, that was that. But there were birds happening. Um, yeah, there, there hasn't been a lot. Uh, I can't tell you what gives. You might know better than me, Jesse, at CCA, because you guys kind of know what's going on environmentally. But it, it is not, <clears throat> excuse me, it has not been a thing. Now, I will say this before everybody gets all up in arms about there being no birds. Years and years and years ago, like I'm talking in the 90s, early 2000s, summertime was not when you saw bird shows. It did not happen. It was always fall. You didn't even look for birds until late September. That was when it really began. Um, the summertime bird gig is a relatively new thing. I think it's been happening more and more since we've had more blues and Spanish coming up, and that's been triggering it. Uh, this year, that didn't really happen much in the Middle Bay. It did It did in the lower portions, like, you know, down towards the Salmon Zone, um, you know, but not not like the last few years. So but but that is, you know, it's a it's a constantly shifting transitional kind of pattern. And I remember years going by where July, August, early September, the, you never saw birds for years in a row. It was all September, October. Tim's asking about the recent heat wave and the fall migration. Man, that's a good question. You know, the water at the mouth of the south dropped into the 70s during the cool off a few weeks ago, and now it's popped right back up into the 80s. It, it, it was like an eight degree shift through the course of a week. What will it do? I don't know. I don't know. I have a couple of theories on a couple of different fish. Zach, this is a segue to our next slide. If you want to throw it up, can we throw it up? Come on, throw it up there. All uh, right, Lars is, yeah, you knew. Zach preempted me. He knew these questions were getting to the next one. What's going on with our silver skinny toothy critters? There he is. There's the cutlass fish. So the month of August, <clears throat> not only had the best cutlass fish, cutlass fish fishing I've ever heard of right outside the South River, you know, the only cutlass fish fishing I've ever heard of right outside the, outside the South River. Uh, you know, like I was saying, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have the summer bird show. We, in my entire life, I never heard of cutlass fish in massive schools outside the South. And they were in massive schools. In one night, we kept count. We kept we caught 59 in about three hours. That's massive numbers. I don't care who you are or how many cutlass fish are you used to. I mean, that's crazy stuff, right? So uh, we heard of a couple in the rivers. I heard of one last week in the Severn. We heard of some in the South. But the, this massive ball of fish just appeared between the green number one and the crossover channel marker, the red and green one. Um, inside, right at the mouth of the south. And these fish, man, there were multiple evenings. We watched them greyhounding. We watched them busting on peanut bunker, jumping clear of the water. The osprey absolutely loved them. Ospreys were circling overhead and diving on them constantly. You'd see six, eight osprey in the same spot, just circling and then coming down and popping these cutlass fish. Um, I put on the blow up there of the little rattle trap because the small rattling swimming plug. And when I say small, I mean like a two incher. That was the killer. That was the utter killer. When they first showed up in early August, we were going out there to the general zone 
we were throwing paddle tails and we were throwing spoons like cast masters. Um, you know, one ounce is two inches. That stuff totally caught them. We caught plenty of fish doing that. But what I came to find was when you started trolling these little swimming plugs, the rattlers, just at idle speed, no faster, like mile and a half to two miles an hour, the cutlass fish just leaped on them. Like they loved them. And those those plugs would catch more than everything else combined. It was just amazing. Now, I prepped this slide on, I guess it was Sunday or Monday, knowing that they might be gone from here. We, I, I haven't seen them. Last night, we didn't see any indications of them. We didn't stop and try and troll for them. But it's been about a week now since I've seen them, and I'm scared that that little cool-off period we had sent them south. Um, Eric Packard was mentioning to me earlier that in at Salmon's, they get them in Mill Creek, and then when they get a cool-off like that, they push out a little further into the river. But these fish were already outside of the river. They were already, you know, in the bay itself, just outside the river mouth. I'm not sure where else to go to look for them. You know, they may have gone south. They may have just chilled out and not been biting, and maybe we'll get another run of them. There's still a ton of bait in the same area. When you go through there, you look on the on the hummingbird, the side scan is just showing patch after patch after patch after patch of these little peanut bunker. So the bait's still there. The bait didn't go anywhere. I'm not 100% sure if the cutlass fish left or if they're just not hitting the last week. But it, it has changed from what it was. Last I heard, they were still down towards the Patuxent in the river there. So you may want to go south if you want to target them. You may try up here. We'll, we'll see. Um, that said, these fish turned out to be just awesome. <laughs> they give you this wacky fight. You get them into the boat. They're just these crazy critters. Uh, when you fillet them, you get this long, skinny fillet, and it's really tasty. It, it's very, it's reminiscent of flounder. It tastes very much like a flounder fillet. You can roll that fillet up into a pinwheel. Uh, you can smoke it. I made cutlass fish jerky. Pretty awesome. Uh, it's it's really good stuff. It really is. So hopefully they're not gone. I'm crossing my fingers, <laughs> but maybe they are. I don't know. We'll see. All right, Zach, we got more questions pouring in, or you want to take us to the next slide? Oh, Robert had one behind his boots, underwear lights, last night in Salmon's. Man, I'll bet that was cool. That would be a sight to see. They're really wild-looking fish. I, and I should mention, they got some gnarly teeth. Look out for those teeth, people. Don't let your fingers get near their mouth. They will hurt you. I, did, I had a double puncture wound in my palm a few weeks ago because I got a little careless. They'll get you. Nathan's asking about the evening bite. Absolutely, yes. Zach, you got to take us to the next slide now because that's the whole topic of the next slide is the evening bite. This picture was not taken while night fishing. This picture was taken uh, literally, that, that's my brother-in-law, Mike. I literally said, oh man, we got to go in. It's dark out. And he said, one more cast. And I said, all right, go for it. And he took one more cast and came up with that. Um but, you know, the, the daytime bite has not really been red hot for the rockfish, at least in the middle bay zone. Uh, it really, it's that evening thing, that last couple hours of light or, or right at daybreak. That's every bit as good, maybe better. So, yeah, absolutely. Get out now for the evening bite. This fish was caught, by the way. You Look, you can almost see like in the living room window of the house behind him. <laughs> that was it like. I don't know, 745, sun was thoroughly down in the South River in about you know, maybe two, two and a half feet of water. So, yeah, that late, that, that evening bite is definitely something you want to get in on right now. All right, let's go to the next one, Zach. We've actually already talked about it some. We'll, we'll kind of fly through this one. Uh, you can see to the angler's left there, it's that uh, white four-inch paddle tail. That's the bait. Go ahead to the blob, Zach. Let's put it up there. There it is. It's just a very simple white paddle tail. That's all there is to it. That's on a half ounce head right there because we're fishing in about seven feet of water. Um, you know, deeper water, you're going to want to go heavier. Uh, you can't. Uh, I blew up this picture, and I guess I blew it up too much. You really can't see. The paint is all chipped off on that thing, 
And that's because we're fishing structure. We're fishing around hard shell bottom and rocks. And that's just what you want to look for right now. All right, let's bop right up to the next one. I got to laugh at myself on this picture. That's my attempt at a selfie right there, people. I'm not very good at it, I freely admit. But what I wanted to put on here was, look at my jacket, right? All right, now go ahead to the next slide, Zach, and let's look at the close-up. Now look at the jig. When it's chilly enough that you need to put your jacket on, put some clothes on that jig. And by that, I mean the skirt. This is, we're, we're getting towards the time of year when it starts to cool off, uh, where I, I start switching from my straight tails. I start adding skirts on everything. Now, I grabbed, Zach, go ahead and make me big, would you? I grabbed a jig specifically to show everybody this skirted jig, right? And I looked at it and I was like, oh, great. I've got one that's bad. And I'm going to tell you why I think it's bad. Not, not bad, just not as good as it could be. First off, these are really skinny rubber hairs on this jig. This is, this is a, you know, I cheaped out and I bought some cheap skirts. And that's what you get. You get the skinny ones. Look for the thicker ones. They give it more volume, more body. And that's what you want in that skirt. You want to boost that profile, right? The other thing is, when you look at this, the, the rubber going forward is every bit the same length as the rubber going backwards. If you buy your skirts separate, okay, they're going to have a band. You can see the band around the, the head right there. Sometimes that band will be right in the middle. Often that band will be two thirds of the way down the skirt and you'll have a long section and a short section. You want that long section pointing forward. That belongs here, not back here along the body because what's forward of that band is what really puffs out and really gives it that extra volume. So you want to make sure when you put it on your head, you put the, the, long rubber forward, the long uh, rubber strands. Now, when you got one like this, where it's even, roll that band down before you put it on and make one side longer. If you stick it on and you're like, oh, they're about even, you can kind of pull it, and I'm doing it right now. You can kind of pull it and make those forward ha hairs, those rubber hairs longer. I'm doing it right now. I'm just going to pull it, put some tension on there. And make them longer. You really only want or need like an inch of rubber on the uh, go, going back here on that side of the band. That's really all you need. Um, you'll notice this is a BKD. I love the BKDs just like the paddle tails. I tend to use the paddle tails more when I want a lot of action out of a lure that I'm not working real hard. And I go to the BKDs when I'm working it really hard. I'm really snapping it because that's when you get that really nice wiggle out of these things. Um, and then truth be told, when the bite's really good, I go to the BKDs also because, hey, they're inexpensive. They don't cost a lot of money. And when the bite's really good and they're working great, why spend more money <laughs> when the jigs and you don't need to? But again, when you put your jacket on, right? When you're like, I need more clothes, that should be a trigger that tells you, I need more clothes on my jig too. That's time to go to the skirts. All right, you want to go ahead and take us to the next one here, Zach? This is the beginning of our segue into 2024. And I wanted to put this slide up here. This is uh, my neighbor and friend and fishing buddy, Vadim. And he's releasing this fish properly because he's not taking it out of the water. Let's remember, people, don't take the fish out of the water if you can avoid it. If you've got a big fish, you want to support its aft end. By big, I mean 30 inch plus. Today, of course, 31 is the upper end of our slot. So you're, you're not keeping fish that big anyway. For God's sakes, please be gentle on them. Now, we are going to see some changes in 2024. I can't tell you exactly what they'll be. Nobody can. But a lot of stuff is getting floated. And at the last, uh, at the last board meeting, for the ASMFC striped bass board, a lot of ideas got floated. One of them was a tighter slot limit 
in the Chesapeake. Now, we are going to see reductions in 2024. I don't know what form they're going to take, but we're going to see reductions. One of the ideas being floated is a tight slot, something along the lines of, you know, 19 to 23 inches. I personally think that's a really bad idea, and I'll tell you why. Right now, recreational anglers are already penalized for, quote, killing a lot of fish because we're saddled with this, quote, best available science, mortality release rate of 9%. Now, the study that that is based on, it's a 1996 study, Diodate and Richards. And it says in the last paragraph, the very study itself says, this study should not be used to calculate coastwide mortality for striped bass. Well, of course, that's exactly what the powers that be do. But why the hell do they do that when they, excuse me, why the heck do they do that when the study itself says don't? Because they are required by law to use the best available science. And that happens to be the best available science that they have. So we're hit with this 9% release mortality rate. If I thought I killed one out of every 10 rockfish I caught, I would stop rock fishing. I think that's ludicrous. Now, is it that high in the summertime? Well, it probably is. Maybe. I, you know, I don't know. But is it, you know, is it that in November when the water's 45 degrees? Heck no. And we have studies that show that too. But again, this is the number we're saddled with. What I'm scared of is we're going to see if, if we have a tight slot like 20 to 23, 19 to 25, whatever. We're going to see the recreational community charged with killing a ton of fish as they catch and release fish in hunt of their unicorn fish to put in the box and take home. Now, there, there are other potential remedies here. We might see a longer summer closure, which considering that we know that the fish do not survive as well during the summer, may well be a good idea. Uh, we may see a loss of season at other times of the year. Um, I, you know, I don't know. We may see a later spring opening. What about trophy season? The ASMFC has so far kept hands off on trophy season. As of right now, it could still happen. Honestly, I'd be shocked if it did. Everybody kind of knows it's a really dumb thing to do at this point, right? Everybody's pretty much there. The charter fleet no longer depends on it for a significant portion of their income. They know those spring fish are hurting. They're just not there the way they used to be. The recreational community kind of has a bad taste in its mouth for killing the trophies at this point anyway. Everybody knows that 45-inch fish, that's a big breeder, you know, the Word is out. The education has been done. Uh, so I personally would be surprised if we see a trophy season. It could happen, but I'd be surprised if we see it. And in my humble opinion, the state would be very wise to take the savings on the fish that we're charged with killing right up front and get rid of that spring trophy season. In fact, think about this for a minute, people. Think about this. If we had a cap at 31 inches rather than a minimum at 35 we could probably open up the spring season the historically trophy season to fishing for 19 to 31 inch fish and do a heck of a lot less damage to the fishery just think about that i'm not saying i'm not saying please do that i'm just saying it's food for thought right a uh, couple other things in specific I wanted to mention about 2024 and the upcoming. For those of you who missed the latest meeting, uh, go to ccamd.org. Click on News. The very first post is a blog post written by Chris Dollar, which kind of gives you the lowdown on how that whole meeting went. It just happened. Uh, it, it was, I think, August one. I might have the date wrong. It's early August. Anyway, if you miss watching that meeting or the, the outcome of it, he gives you the lowdown in that post, ccamd.org, and then click on the news button. If you own a boat and you can afford to fill the fuel tank and you're still not a member of CCA, you got no excuse. While you're there reading up on this very important critical issue, 
click and join, okay? It'll cost you less than 10 gallons of gas. About the same price as two dozen bloodworms in this day and age. For God's sakes, join, help CCA, get a little more strength and a little more ammunition when it sits at the table as these upcoming regulations are discussed. Because guess what? You, recreational angler, you have one seat at the table. You have one representative, and that is CCA Maryland. So no more excuses. I hope somebody calls me up tomorrow and says, oh, my God, we got 10 new members last night after you said that. I really do. God, it would make me so happy. You got no excuse. 10 gallons of gas, two bags of bloodworms. For God's sakes, join, please. It'll help us all. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, well, that was it on the specific rockfish. I did also want to mention another big problem we have with the rockfish. Forget about fishing. Forget about commercial fishing. Our water quality stinks. We've got a lot of habitat issues. And the biggest, scariest thing about the rockfish fishery right now is not how many fish we're catching. It's not how many fish are out there. It's how many babies are not surviving. We have four years in a row of a horrific young of the year survey. And we've had pretty good conditions for a spawn a couple of those, at least one of those years. And I think maybe two, we had, you know, decent, if not really good conditions. So it's not even that the eggs aren't being hatched necessarily the babies aren't surviving you can bet that water quality and habitat is a big part of that now zach mentioned at the beginning of tonight uh thursday september 21st 7 p.m 7 p.m same time uh, same same channel different time right but we're doing it on the same channels we have here our chesapeake perspectives this is the last of the year folks it is going to focus on habitat preservation and restoration and there's probably not a more important topic for anybody who cares anything about the chesapeake bay i've watched it get better in my lifetime and then watched it turn around and start to get worse again and we're we're on the down slope right now as far as i can tell i wish i was wrong i hope i'm wrong but we're, we're not getting better right now we're holding even at best and uh, you know what? In the late 90s, early 2000s, early 2000s, it, it was improving. It was, we've seen it improve. This is a really critical topic. So everybody, please tune in. 7 o'clock, the Thursday after next, September 21. <clears throat> All right. Woo, man. Uh, we did have one slide left, Zach. I think we should put it up there. Can we put it? There it is. <laughs> so that's my son, David. And it just occurred to me, man, we're already over time, but if we don't put up the David slide, eh, he's going to be bummed. <laughs> so the reason I wanted to put this one on here is because this is our, you can tell he's really dressed for the weather, right? We're into November here, or it might even be December. Actually, that was probably December. Um, and we will see some bigger fish show up. And let's remember, 31 inches is now our cap when there's big fish and I will make a commitment right here. And right now I'm not going to keep any over 28. I'm just not. And you know what? Half of it is because the 24 inch fish is a heck of a lot better to eat. So I'm going to go look for that 24 and let the fish like this go. Uh, but I did want to put up this slide specifically because David is showing uh, a good demo here on the proper way to hold these fish. He's got, uh, the jaw pinned down with one thumb. He's got his other hand supporting at the at the base of the belly. That's kind of how you want to hold these. He got the hook out. Fish went over the side, and that's exactly what should happen. Very quick process. You got to remember for the fish, it's like holding its breath. It can't breathe. So if you lift a fish out of the water to take a photo, what I always say is, when you lift it out of the water, hold your breath. <sighs> hold your breath. And then you, as you're taking your picture, you'll have an inkling of what that fish is feeling like and how quick you want to get it back in the water. All right. Well, that was our last slide. We're a little bit over time. I don't think hardly over time. Zach, do we have any more questions coming up? 
Uh, well, we had a bunch we never actually addressed. Um, you know, we can circle back if you'd like to do a little. We can we can lightning round questions, or we can do our spinny wheel. I think we should do the spinny wheel of winner, winner, winnage. Yeah. Yeah. Let's find out who's going to be the lucky winner of uh, of one of Wayne's books. All right. Well, you said you sound depressed. You don't want to do the spinny wheel? I do. <laughs> Well, my name's not in there, so you know. Oh. Uh, you know, I actually had another uh, bookmark here. Hold on a sec. So, and just so people know, it, as you're making comments and asking questions, that's how your name's going into the hat. Those who have asked questions that we've addressed, their names are all in the hat. Oh. John, <laughs> John is asking if his 42-inch halibut last week was bigger than mine on my honeymoon. John? I love you, man, but I got some bad news for you, buddy. That's an awesome fish. Melissa and I caught some that were topping 100 pounds. Um, I'm not sure we did length on them, but we got one that was like 140 or 150 and several that were like 120. Since you're able, physically able to lift that fish, I'm saying as we're bigger. But you can talk to Melissa about that too. <laughs> that is a beautiful fish. <laughs> Just for the record... John couldn't keep it. It was over slot. He had to let it go. But I think he did get a smaller one that they were able to take home. They are some tasty fish right there. Incredibly tasty fish. I think when Melissa and I came home from our honeymoon, there was no upper slot back then. I think we flew home with 200 pounds of fish uh, between the halibut, the salmon, the rock bass, we got all kinds of stuff there. Alaska is a pretty amazing fishery. Maryland Rod and Reef Slam is a youth tournament this year. Last year's tournament was so much fun. Adam, they did make all kinds of changes with the Reef Slam. I believe, uh, I believe it's actually part of next Saturday's uh, right. Oyster Blues and Brews. It's a Rod and Reef Fishing Derby. Um, that's listed on the uh, itinerary of events and Check out oysterbluesandbrews.com. Be a yeah. family-friendly event. That was a really fun event. It's fun to try and catch different species as opposed to, you know, the biggest fish. That was a lot of fun. All right. Are you going to speed round these questions? I got a whole bunch. All right. Blast me, man. All right. You're super, super. We, we missed a few earlier, and I apologize to our friend Fred. Um He was asking about uh, cobia and gulp eels under floats. Is that something? Mm. Honest answer, I don't know. I haven't heard of that. I'm not saying it will work. I don't know. Okay. Well, we certainly love gulp, so it's, you know, definitely works. Uh, there's another cobia question. Uh, with the cobia tailors this year. Haven't really heard about it. I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, sometimes these bites escape my attention, but – usually i hear i haven't have not heard have not been hearing that this year it's really it was thin right up until a couple weeks ago uh anywhere really north of the cbbt um i know i know back in july i spoke with some folks who come out of the james and they weren't even fishing locally they were running south and definitely the people in the rap a lot of them were running south the rap did not have the kind of action it has the last few years. But again, these last couple of weeks, just south of the targets at live bottom, 15, 18 feet of water, that's, that's been seeing some action. Bird show is happening in Eastern Bay between 12 and 3. That's interesting. I, That's long after, or I mean, long before we got there. We got there way later, but that's interesting. Cool. Snakeheads caught in the tribs of the Middle River. What kind of lure would you recommend? We'll be fishing weed beds and piers. They are definitely going to be a Middle River. I mean, they're in all the rivers, really. Once you get, you know, once it's not real salty, they're they're there. Um, Zach, I'm going to let you field this, man. You're better on snakes than I am. Um, top three choices: uh, a, a, a white or you know natural color paddle tail, like a Houdini on a weedless hook, would be a good choice to have. I'd have a couple rods uh, rigged up if you got heavy cover. You know you're gonna in the weed beds, uh, top water frog or any kind of top water weedless. Weedless is the key. If you're fishing weed beds, weedless. So weedless paddle tails, 
Um, a lot of guys like the inline spinners. They're semi-weedless. You might get hung up. Um, if you have your hands on some live minnows uh, under 6 to 12 inches under a bobber just outside those weed lines and piers, that could be an option too. So that would be my top three picks for what you're looking at. But if there's no frogs or anything like that in that sort of ecosystem, don't throw frogs. You know, if you're in an area like – if you're down Middle Bay, South River, there's not really a lot of frogs. Don't don't throw a frog. They're looking for fish. They're looking for bait fish and small things. Mimic mimic what they're feeding on in that area. That sounds good to me. You didn't mention my new favorite, the fluke. The fluke. I like Man. the flukes. I like the white flukes. The fluke did it for me I'm earlier. A, the fluke on a ra- uh, the fluke. I'll be number four. The fluke on okay. uh, uh, the chatterbait. I, I like might- I might have to try some new stuff because I my fluke didn't even make your top three. It's number four. Fluke on the channel, bit, chatter bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, another sneaky question, it's, and it's a little confusing because he's asking for decent places south of Love Point to Poplar to catch snakehead. So that's a little bit of main stem. So head up, up, up. You know, yeah. Uh, up the, if you're Love Point, head up to Chester uh, as far as you can go, um, as far as you're willing to go. Look for feeder creeks and. But the, the fresh, the fresher you can get, the better. Uh, you know, there. You hear a lot about uh, snakeheads being caught in tributaries in the Middle Bay early in the year when the water's still kind of fresh, and then as soon mm-hmm. as that summer salt rolls in, they kind of vanish and head to the you know headwaters and, and, and such. So. Uh. Thomas just signed up for CCA. Uh, thank you. You made my night. Thomas, you made my night. <laughs> horrified. CC membership done. Yes. Dave's joining you. tomorrow. So we got Come on, Dave. Come on, Dave. Today, today, today. We, got, we got three confirmed. So we're seven more. Come on. Set. We need seven more. <laughs> there you go. Um, how far north did the sea bass get? We touched on that earlier. Patapsco River. I think that's yeah. as far north as we know. Yeah. And you know, they it's not a that they stay i mean shucks man they'll they'll stay in middle bay zones you know right up until it gets so cold that no one's fishing anymore i mean they'll into december they're late leavers they do not leave early now they move deep that's the difference they transition deep excuse me but if you find hard structure in like 50 feet of water in december you can find sea bass Tend to late, but weren't even touch with Spanish. And if they left the Lerman Bay yet, they haven't left. They didn't, they didn't really come that much, you know, not in the middle bay. Um, they, but no, they have not left. The 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 mouth of the chop tank is kind of the most reliable area I've been hearing of. But again, it hasn't been great. Most people that I talk with who caught them are getting, say, a half a dozen bluefish and a mackerel or two when they're trolling their spoons. That's kind of an average catch. I've heard of, you know, eight or 10 blues and three mackerel. That's haven't heard of a whole lot better than that in the middle Bay zone until you get all the way down towards Salmon's a little bit South that area, you know, the numbers get a little better. Um, and then, you know, better as you go South, but they, they certainly have not left. They have not departed. All right, we got a couple questions uh, regarding blue cats. I'm going to pop them up real quick. They're sort of related. Tim asked if blue cats have anything to do with rockfish young. Um, Tim, my worst fear. I, You know, who can say at this point, right? We don't have solid scientific studies, but my worst fear. Yeah. Some have speculated they're chasing the white perch up the bay in the spring and decimating them during the spring spawn. Wouldn't it be necessary? Yeah, sure would, Kevin. It sure would. A lack of scientific study is our biggest problem with half the stuff we've talked about tonight. What's happening with the white perch? What's happening with the rockfish? What's our real mortality release rate? Not just our rate, but what's our rate in the spring, summer, and fall? And what's our rate live lining versus jigging versus trolling, right? If we could answer these questions, the fishery could be managed so much more wisely, so much more effectively. But we have had a tremendous lack of science. The, the, the powers that be are going back to a 1996 study done in a salt pond in Massachusetts, which says, don't use the numbers for this. That's what they're using. 
So that's how good our scientific studies are. Vince is saying blue cats can be hard to get rid of when the market is 30 cents a pound. Vince, they're getting a lot more than that, actually. As I as I understand it, I've been told uh, 70, 80 cents is more a normal number. There are a number of guys who are commercially catching them and are doing well, um, but not enough. Not enough, obviously. I saw a figure on the number uh, they had to remove, and it was huge to have a real impact. Uh, why two rockfish rigs, one for the bay, one for the coastal? So they are managed separately. They have historically always been managed separately. Um, you kind of have to. And remember, if you're fishing in the Chesapeake Bay, you're catching a, most of the time, you're catching a resident fish. Those fish live here until they hit around 28, 30 inches and then they begin to migrate. So the migratory fish are the fish that have already left the bay. Completely different fishery. Now, we do get a pop at them in the spring, which, of course, you know, I think a better question is why not a coastal regulation for the spring fishery, but then again, those fish are about to spawn, even though those are the fish that are normally caught off the coast. So, we, you know, we got to address that differently, too. But again, that's why. it's Historically, it's always been that way. They're very different fisheries in reality, um, and they're very different groups of fish. Woof, more coming. Is there a chart showing dead zone area? Yeah, Michael, there absolutely is. Go to eyesonthebay.net. That has a number, number of different charts in a number of different ways. Eyesonthebay.net. That will pull it up for you. New sea bass rig closed October 1 to October 10. What is that, bay or coastal? Can you please recommend anyone who does fishing rod repair? Patrick, I can't. <laughs> uh, I'm always dissatisfied whenever I try and have any fishing rod repaired. My best advice to you is to buy a new fishing rod, unless it's just a tip top, tip top. And in that case, you can get the tip top. I saw what popped in on the bay there. That's interesting. I did not know that. That's news to me. Um, yeah, you can get a tip top replaced. But beyond that, you know, uh, time to get a new rod. Kevin is speaking out on the trophy season. Absolutely. The desire, desire to put 2015 year class. Uh, that's a whole nother ball of wax. That's the whole reason we have this slot is to exclude the, uh, I'm sorry, the coastal slot closed at 31 inches is to exclude that 2015 year class. I, I think the protections are pretty well in place. As long as that slot is in place, that's been extended I don't want to say the wrong thing. It, it's been extended. I'm not sure if it's through October next year or what, but there's also a very good chance that that slot will be made, you know, semi-permanent at the next meeting. They did kick the can down the road at the August 1 meeting. Again, you can go to cca.org, click on news. You can get the lowdown on what happened at that meeting. That was part of it. That was part of it. They did not make that, uh, you know, a, a, a longer term thing, but they did extend it. And, I, you know, I, I think it's likely we'll continue to see that kind of a ceiling, that kind of a slot. Oh, any advice for fishing jigs at the bridge pilings? I've been trying four-inch paddle tails with three-quarter ounce heads at Key and Severn River bridges, but no luck all summer. Dang, Andrew, you should. You're fishing the right stuff. You don't mention color. Uh, you know, white, chartreuse, electric chicken, that kind of stuff should be doing it for you. I'd want to know, are you letting it sink after it lands? Uh, if you have a strong current running past those pilings, are you casting ahead of them and then letting it sink? That's going to play a role. Are you fishing in front of where the current's hitting or only behind them? That's going to play a role. Uh, a lot of other variables. You know what, Andrew? You know what I'm going to say? Because uh, it sounds to me like you're throwing the right stuff and you should have some luck. I think you should go to fishtalkmag.com and plug Bay Bridge into the search box. We do have an article specifically on how to jig the Bay Bridge and an article. I think you should check that out. Try and try and nail down. There's something going on, and I don't know what it is. You got to try and nail down what it is, because if you've been doing it all summer, you you should be you should have seen some fish. You should have seen some fish. You know, tides a factor, time of day is a factor. There are a lot of factors, but if you've been doing it all summer, you, you should be seeing some fish.
How we doing, Zach? Are we plugging through them? Yep, yep. What time we got? 720. We'll keep going. David's asking about Tangier Speco traded waste for the fall transition. David, first off, dude, text me, call me, ask me. Second off, <laughs> um, they're going to be shuffling deeper. Uh, they're actually. Uh, let me take that back. They're going to be shuffling shallower. Then they're going to be shuffling deeper. Right now, it's hot enough that the shallows are probably not going to really be the zone. You might find some weed beds with some fish. You're going to find some structure with some fish. But my guess is they're hanging in eight-plus feet of water right now. Uh, I haven't haven't fished it recently. We did have last week's cool down, but it's still pretty darn hot out there. Um, they'll come up into the shallow shallows as soon as that temperature starts falling off. And then when it gets really cold, they'll do the reverse. They'll start going deep again. Um, <laughs> I find that funny coming from David because when we get together, which is often, or when we text or talk, which is often, this is kind of always the topic. <laughs> All right. One last question. And it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Salt Strong is advertising artificial intelligence on their fishing app. Do you have an opinion of it? First off, Patrick, completely news to me. Second off, I have yet to see an app that is a fishing app that really help people catch fish. Now, there are ones that are very specific that are very helpful. Um, the depth, what's the name of the depth one, Zach? Uh, uh, trolling Depth Calculator. Trolling depth calculator. Like you can plug in a particular lure and the particular gear you're using and the particular speed you're going, and it will tell you how deep that lure is running. And that that can be really helpful. But like all these moon moon phase, uh, I, I have yet to see one that is really, really good. And a lot there are a ton of apps out there that are really quite big, that have huge followings, that have like, you know, site-specific information. And it's really interesting because, you know, I never know that you can catch a tarpon in Annapolis Waterworks Pond. But there are apps out there that will tell you that you can catch a tarpon in Annapolis Waterworks Pond. There are apps out there that will tell you that there's a great permit bite in the South River. Uh, big ones. Big apps that you know the name of. <laughs> uh, I take all that stuff with a big heaping grain of salt. Can you find some interesting intel and learn some stuff that you didn't know that, that's accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And like I say, there are some apps out there that can be very helpful for very specific things. But on the whole, you got to take everything you see in that stuff with a grain of salt. You really do. Same goes with a lot of websites. There are a lot of fishing articles out there on websites that are gruesome to me to read. Because they say stuff like, you know, oh, yeah, permit in the South River, tarpon in tarpon in Eastern Bay. Like, it's, you've seen them. People have, I know people have seen them. You've seen them out there. Because, you, you know, everybody looks at the web. You see this stuff. Just take everything with a grain of salt. Woo. Well, did we cover it, Zach? Because we are way over time and I'm getting hoarse. Um. I think we did. And if we didn't, we apologize. Um, All right. Time for speed wheel. You speed know, wheel. there was a question about boat market and everything like that. But, I, you know, this was a, you know, we'll, that we'll discuss that uh, kind of stuff later in another episode. Uh, this one's a little more fishing oriented. So um, really appreciate everyone tuning in. So, Lenny, just, this is the. Here's the spinny wheel. I love this. Wayne Young. Wayne Young's new uh, Bay Bridge book. Is that correct? I believe so. I see that. I love that you put fish talk in the middle of the spinny wheel. I, yeah, is, they custom made this for us. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> We're kind of a big deal. Or should we hit the wheel? Hit the wheel, man. Let's see who wins. Are you sure? I'm positive. It's not moving fast enough. You're going to make it move faster, right? There we go. And 
Mike Snyder. Nice. All right. Mike, we don't, we're not sure if you are on uh, Facebook or YouTube, but if you could reach out to Lenny at fishtalkmag.com. Sorry about that. They're really excited up in the back <laughs> in the studio up here. <laughs> um, Lenny at fishtalkmag.com, and uh, he'll uh, set that up for you. Awesome. Congrats, Mike. And John, I saw John Beal was so close. He went by him. I was like, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> I'm happy for Mike, but I love John. I hate to see him disappointed. John, I'll get you a book. Don't worry. Oh, it got dark, didn't it? <laughs> it is dark. Well, it's getting dark. This is this is about, we were still fishing at this time last night. Yeah, and we caught some bluefish, and I have to go turn the smoker on and fire that Ooh, up. Ooh, nice. I love it. Yeah. Zach, thank you for all your help tonight. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, don't forget, Chesapeake Perspectives, two weeks, two Thursdays from now, 7 p.m., habitat, water quality, critical. And in the meantime, if you want to hop over to Fish Talk Bag for slash Chesapeake Perspective, you can sign up to get an email to be notified when we go live in two weeks. You can also watch the two previous um, installments from this year, mm -hmm. as well as the three-part series on the past, present, future mm -hmm. striped bass from 2022. Lots of content. It's like, I mean, it's it's your fishing Netflix, right? I mean, you got it's like, it's like 10 hours of fishing documentary right there. Great way to put it. I never thought of that. And we've got a great panelist of some experts coming up for this next uh, third final series of uh, 2023. Looking forward to it. And I'll see you then. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night.